So this is a little video which is a follow-up to the last video on discriminating two quantum states and is a bit of a precursor to lecture six. So in that last little video on discriminating two quantum states, we talked about this problem. If you have uh, two known qubit states, and let's say call, it U, call them u and v, and they're at an angle of theta, and you're promised you're given some unknown state, psi, which is either u or v, uh, what is the best probability with which you can distinguish between the case that psi equals u and psi equals v? And we talked about how uh, the best you can do uh, depends on the angle between the two qubit states. Let's assume they're qubit states with real amplitudes. Uh, so it depends on the angle theta. And it also depends whether you're going for a, an algorithm with two-sided error or one-sided error or zero-sided error. And I described three algorithms last time uh, which did better or worse depending on the kind of error and the angle theta. And if you'll notice, I was always considering in that video the angle theta ranging between zero degrees, meaning u and v are identical, in which case you can't really do anything trivial. You can't discriminate between two states that are the same, of course, and an angle of 90 degrees, which is perpendicular, in which case um, you can actually discriminate them between them perfectly. Actually, in this green curve, that was a suboptimal distinguishing algorithm that we talked about. But you might ask, why do we only consider angles between zero and 90 degrees? I mean, after all, if you have two angles in, in two dimensions or two vectors in two dimensions, their angle can be anywhere between zero and 180. So in fact, let's think about that. Let's think about the case where the angle between the two qubit states that you're trying to discriminate, u and v, is obtuse, as in the picture. Well, in fact, you can do the same thing we talked about last time, and you'll find that this curve, or these curves, extend symmetrically from zero degrees to 180 degrees. Okay, so as the angle actually becomes uh, greater than perpendicular, your ability to distinguish gets worse, you have more error. And in fact, you go back to the situation of having maximal error when the angle is 180 degrees. So in fact, one thing this uh, suggests, the symmetry is that um, if you were to take the problem of distinguishing between u and v, and switch to the problem of distinguishing between negative u and v, this will uh, have the effect of switching theta to 180 degrees minus theta, which you can actually see from the picture does not change anything. So distinguishing between v and u is as difficult as distinguishing between v and negative u. And for that reason, uh, that was the reason we actually cut off the angle in the last video between zero and 90 degrees. But in fact, uh, something interesting happens if you focus on this case, that of 180 degrees, you see that your ability to distinguish between two states is just as bad in this case as the ability to distinguish between two states at angle zero. In other words, to distinguish between two identical states. And in fact, that's correct. If you have two states at angle 180 degrees, such as u and negative u, you cannot distinguish them between them at all. So for example, the red curve represented uh, the best error probability you could achieve if you were allowed two-sided error. That is to say, you were allowed to make a mistake when the uh, unknown state is u, and you're also allowed to make a mistake when the unknown state is minus u, and you're trying to keep that mistake bound as low as possible, mistake probability as low as possible. You see that when they're at 180 degrees, uh, the best error you can achieve is 50%. In other words, you can't do any better than just completely random guessing if you're trying to tell the difference between u and minus u. So in fact, we have a very interesting situation here, which we haven't mentioned previously in the course, but will be important to know in the future, which is that the state u and the state negative u are indistinguishable. In other words, if I give you an unknown qubit psi and I tell you it's either u or it's negative u, there's absolutely no physical experiment that you can do to distinguish them. And for that reason, one should actually regard them as identical states. They're physically identical if no experiment can tell them apart. So in fact, uh, this is an important thing to remember. The state u and the state negative u are in fact physically indistinguishable. So what do I mean by this? Well, um, you know, what are the operations that we know that we can do? One thing we can do is we can um, rotate the unknown state psi or apply a unitary transformation. So that's fine. We could do that. We could rotate psi in such a way that uh, the vector u became zero and the vector minus u became minus zero. Okay, so maybe that would be rotating it by uh, 135 degrees clockwise or something like that, and given the previous picture. 
Um, but it doesn't help because, well, the state zero and the state negative zero are also indistinguishable, as we'll see. I mean, you can rotate it as much as you want. You'll preserve the fact that these two states have u and v have, uh, sorry, u and negative u have angle 180 degrees. And the only other thing that we can imagine doing is uh, measuring. We can try to measure the state. So let's suppose we measure the state here. Well, uh, if the unknown state is zero, then you'll read out zero with 100% probability. And also if the unknown state is minus zero, you'll also read out zero on your measuring device with 100% probability, because not only is the amplitude one squared equal to one, the amplitude of negative one squared is also equal to one. And furthermore, you know, we know that the measurement causes the state to collapse uh, into, you know, the component in the direction uh, where the measurement readout was. Well, in that case, that just means zero collapses to zero and minus zero collapses to minus zero. In other words, nothing changes. So if you arrange for this state of affairs by rotating psi, or if you're just trying to distinguish between psi being zero or psi being negative zero, well, you can measure, but you'll always get the outcome zero and nothing about the state will change. So you'll gain absolutely no information. So this pretty much shows that there's nothing you can do to distinguish between uh, a quantum state that's u and a quantum state that's minus u. So in fact, uh, a little bit more is true. It's also true that the state u and the state i times u, these are also just indistinguishable by any physical experiment. So you can imagine if we were trying to distinguish the state uh, ket zero from the state amplitude i on ket zero, we haven't talked about that too much because it's a little hard to draw the picture. But again, rotation doesn't really help. And if you measure, you'll again just see zero with 100% probability and the state collapse won't change the state. And you can also check for yourself that uh, the state ket u and the state c times ket u are also indistinguishable whenever c is a complex number of magnitude one. Okay, be that c equals negative one, in the case where we're trying to distinguish u from negative u, or c equals i in the case that we're distinguishing uh, ket u from i times ket u, uh, in the case where c is one, whenever we're trying to distinguish u from u. Uh, in all of these cases, it's impossible. There's no physical measurement that you could do that will distinguish these two cases. Okay, and uh, this last case, this number c, a complex number of magnitude one that might be measured, multiplied against your state, is sometimes called a global phase. Okay, phase basically just means a complex number of magnitude one, and uh, you'll see this phrase arise when people say, oh, um, you know, a state u is indistinguishable from the same state multiplied by a global phase, or, you know, multiplying a qubit state by a global phase doesn't matter because it, you know, leaves you with a state that's indistinguishable. So that's a little um, fact that's true about quantum states. It's a little bit of a clunkiness in our notation, as we'll see, um, but it's a good thing to keep in mind that uh, multiplying a state by a complex number of magnitude one doesn't change any physical property of it. So as I said, this actually means that the notation that we've been using for quantum states is slightly clunky because we have two different mathematical notations that look like they're describing different states, but in fact, these are indistinguishable physical objects. And so it would actually be better if we had a, a better notation wherein indistinguishable states had identical mathematical notation. So we're not quite there. In fact, in about a dozen lectures, we're gonna study a concept called mixed quantum states. And this will also arise briefly in the next lecture, lecture six. A mixed quantum state is a classical probability distribution for quantum states. It's a little bit complicated. It's why we haven't talked about it yet. But when we eventually do study mixed quantum states, we're gonna actually change our notation for quantum states. And when we do that, this uh, clunkiness will be fixed. The state u and the state minus u will actually be represented by the same um, mathematical object. But we'll save that for later and we'll just not worry so much now about the fact that um, there's a little bit of clunkiness here with our notation that multiplying a state by a global phase uh, doesn't really affect it. In fact, I'll, I'll just end on uh, an interesting note which will arise in the next lecture, which is that the following so-called mixed states are also indistinguishable. Uh, and this is something you can think about in preparation for lecture six. So imagine two scenarios, which I'll call the blue scenario, scenario row one, and the red scenario, uh, which I'll call scenario row two. In the blue scenario, row one, um, somebody flips a, flips a fair coin, and if it's heads, they set a qubit psi to be in state ket zero. And if it's tails, they set the qubit psi to be in state uh, ket one. Okay, now you don't get to see the coin flip and you don't get to watch them prepare the state, but if, the, if they do flip uh, 
uh, heads, they set it to be zero. If they flip it to the tails, they set uh, phi to be ket one. Okay, so that's scenario row one. And scenario row two is a different scenario this person may employ. In this different scenario, they again flip a fair coin, but they use a different basis. If they flip heads, they'll set the unknown qubit to plus, and if they set flip tails, they'll set it to minus. Okay, so it's a little bit complicated because in both scenario row one and scenario row two, there are two possibilities for what happens, and that possibility is based on uh, coin flip. But anyway, let's say your friend uh, chooses of their own will to do scenario row one or scenario row two, and they flip the coin and they prepare the state uh, ket psi, and finally they give this you know photon or particle to you, and ask you to try to guess: Did they choose scenario row one or did they choose scenario row two? Well, you think about it a little bit, but it turns out that there's, again, no physical measurement that you can do to tell the difference with any advantage at all, even, you know, guessing better than 50-50, whether they chose scenario row one or scenario row two, even though, you know, the thing that they did in the two scenarios looks very different. Okay, so this is another example where you can have a qubit state. It's a very complicated state because it involves probability and qubits. Um, that's indistinguishable from a seemingly different looking qubit state. Okay, so we'll uh, study the mathematical formalism of this much later, but this is a scenario that will arise in, in the next lecture when we talk about measuring uh, particles in multi-qubit systems.